thought. Yeah. So who would have thought that four months ago when I stood on the stage the first Sunday of March that we would have ever had quarantine? And then who would have even thought even crazier that I would leave that and come to this? Who would have thought that on that Sunday as I came up and preached and yelled and acted like I was going to be at Youth Alive forever? And I truly believe that. And then in May, make a switch and Pastor Kendall light me up on caller ID and say, Kyle, will you come be our executive pastor? And Pastor Barry would leave the church and I would come into the church. Who would have ever thought? Who would have ever known only by the grace of God. Proverbs 16, 9 says this, that it, many are the plans in a man's heart, but God's will, his purpose prevails. He establishes our steps. You see, me and my wife and my family, we're one of those people, one of those families that we go all in. Like we're all in forever, like all in. We're radicals, like if we're playing golf or football or we're eating, I'm all in. I eat like it's my last meal I'm ever going to eat. My wife said to her, Kyle, stop chewing so loud and stop eating so fast. I'm like, this could be the last one. And so I take that same approach to my job, and I'm like, I'm going to be here forever. And many of you during this transition, you came up to us, and you're like, man, this is really cool. We're really excited that Kyle and Janelle are at Freedom now, but... We never thought you would have left. We, never, we, we thought you were going to be there forever. And like, what did you think? Like, I was going to come in here and preach and be like one foot in, one foot out. John, you know what I'm saying? Like, hey, if I get the right call, I'm out of here in a heartbeat. Like, I really don't love this stuff. No, because it was more than a job. It was a calling by God that was deep inside of our system that said we are all in. So that video you just watched is literally being played every third day at our campground. As At, at camp, they're saying goodbye to us right now. So I've got two more weeks to finish out with Youth Alive, and then in two weeks, all in at Freedom, every day, all day, every single Sunday, to where the transition has taken place from what we did to what we do now. Now, Pastor Kendall gave me this Sunday, and I thought it'd be appropriate, because I'd never get this time back, appropriate to come and kind of walk you through just how good God is, because sometimes in the details of transition, we graze over, and we don't see the bigger picture of what God's trying to do in us and through us, and as an example for all people. Do you realize that when we announced a few Weeks ago, we announced us youth, leaving Youth Alive to coming into freedom on Sunday of Memorial Day weekend. When we left our local church to go into Youth Alive, it was exactly the same Sunday, Sunday of Memorial Day weekend, exactly 12 years later. We didn't plan it like that, but he did. Oh, do you understand that when I shook Pastor Kendall's hand at La Madeline over at Vista Ridge Mall and shook his hand and shook his hand and shook his hand and said, I accept the offer to leave, listen, my dream job to come now to this dream job. Do you understand that the email that I opened when I got back in the car with a big grin on my face, I got a new job, I got a new job. I, listen, the email that popped up first was from my national office, U.S. Missions of the Assemblies of God, and it said, congratulations, Kyle, you have just completed three three terms, 12 years as a youth alive missionary, and this summer is all about renegotiating contracts, obtaining new signatures, and starting the process for this fall and spring to start re-itinerating and raising new money for your next four years, which would make 16 years. <laughs> I did what a lot of you do when you get email, slide to the left, push the red button, slide to the left, push the red button, slide to the left, and push the red button, Duh! Isn't it crazy that my last school assembly would be in Amarillo, Texas, and I'll be driving home with one of the guys named Taylor, who you saw pictured in a lot of those pictures. Taylor has been my right-hand man for the last six years. I would not want to do a school assembly without him. He is the, the guts and the core of what we do together as a team. And I just randomly, this was in March, I got the job in May, I randomly asked Taylor, Taylor, what if I left youth alive? Like, what would you do? Would you take over this and run this for me in my absence if I went to another job, another assignment? He goes, well, I was actually gonna talk to you last week when we were in Oklahoma. I'm actually done. This is my last semester. What? Where are you going? What are you doing? He said, I don't know yet. I just feel like God's tugging on my heart for something new, something next. I feel like I'm going to go back into the local church and maybe be a youth pastor. I'm like, you're kidding me, man. You're going to leave me? 
I had little to no expectation that when I called Taylor to tell him that we accepted the job at Freedom, that he would also tell me to pause and hang on because he is also in that same week, same week, same week, accepted a job as well in Kansas as a youth pastor in a local church. So Taylor and I effectively finished together and in the same week accepted jobs back in the local church. Is it not crazy that COVID literally killed all of my schedule, that all of my camps outside the state were canceled, all of my conventions, all of my schools, all of my services, I had no Sundays, no Wednesdays. My calendar was literally blank. And when Pastor Kendall calls, I go, what is this? This is incredible at what a time and what a season that God would bring such a change, a change on our end, but a change on the new guy coming in, that he can come in and start and be able to raise up new funds and new budget as a new school year begins and a new passion begins for reaching schools and students across North Texas. But see, it's not just professionally, it's also personally, because when we go through transitions in our lives, you understand that God cares about this, but he also cares about this, who you are and what you do. Listen, it's been a dream of my wife and I to stay in this area all of our lives. I don't know, it's just something inside of me that I come from a mom who's been married six times, a dad who's been married five times, and as a little teenager and a little elementary school kid, I was literally bounced around the place from grandma's house to aunt's house to all kinds of places. I lived all over the Metroplex went to so many different schools, and I just thought it'd be really, really cool if I could break that curse that was upon my family of divorce and movement, and I could stay solid and consistent. I thought it'd be really cool if my kids could live in the same house their entire life and maybe graduate from the same schools that they grew up in all their life. And God says, Kyle, I got you. I got you to every T cross and I dotted. I'm checking every box for you. Do you realize that my wife and I live 14 miles from here, and depending on the red lights, on East Hebron Parkway, it only takes 20 to 22 minutes to get here. God cares about every detail and every box and every moment of your life. You tell me he doesn't, he did it for me. So then why in the world would I leave my dream job, I'm telling you dream job, to stand in front of gymnasiums and football stadiums and preach the gospel and get kids to an altar so they can respond to Christ? Why would I leave that dream job and come to what would be now this dream job? Have you not seen freedom? You see, sometimes when we come to church, we we get lost in the fact of what's going on around us, and we can kind of take for granted what's happening right here. Sometimes when you're raised in a church, you you don't understand really how good your pastor is. You don't understand how good your worship team is. You don't understand how good the families are. I've traveled, spoken in hundreds of churches, and you saw those stats there, and the reason why I'm leaving that is to come to this. Freedom Church is a kick-butt church. Oh, I thought that'd get somebody fired up, Cash. Come on, man. This is a kick-butt church that is on mission and on fire for God. Listen, we have incredible facilities here. Have you seen them? Like, we have an amazing auditorium with amazing stuff, cafes, all kinds of great location, great kids' facilities, student facilities. We have all this stuff. I've been to some little shotgun churches that hold about 50 people, and we've got an amazing piece of property and amazing facilities to reach lots of people. Have you not met our pastor? There's a reason why I left my dream job to come work for Pastor Kendall. In fact, I didn't say this in all the other services and I know a lot of people are watching online, but listen, I wouldn't have done this job for about three pastors in North Texas and it'd take me about three hours to figure out number two and three. When Kendall called, I said yes, why? Because I respect that man. I love his passion, I love his vision. I love how passionate he is about family. I love how passionate he is about getting to know you and bringing revival to this church. When Kendall said yes, I follow. I love that man, I love that family, and I will serve him with all my heart. I'm all, listen, I'm all in. Have you not seen our staff? That we've got the greatest youth pastor on the planet. We've got the greatest, come on, our kids pastor was on the stage, the greatest kids pastor. Have you not seen our media team and a lot of you watching online, how awesome it is for what? The media team to be able to put this package together and you be able to watch it every single Sunday and look like a live television broadcast. Have you not seen all of our connections and all of our administrative people and have you not met our business director who's Tracy, who's not just great. Oh yeah, give it up for Tracy. Have you not seen that she's good at crunching numbers but also getting a hold of God? 
It's not just about business for her, it's about seeing God move as well. Have you not met each other, how so interconnected this church is and how we care about each other and help and invest and turn to each other, that this church is missional, we're generous, we're all about giving to the community and the world, how we support 84 missionaries around the world, but yet we support ministries and local organizations to also effectively reach to people in our backyard. Have you not seen how multicultural and diverse we are, that we we are a great picture of heaven. Oh, we're just not an old white church. We're not just a young black church. We're not just a middle-aged Indian church. No, 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 no. We got young people, middle-aged people, old people, and all in between. And we got all colors of skin here, and that's the church that I want to be a part of. I want a church where every nation, every ethnicity, and every people group are represented. I love Freedom Church, and when I'm leaving my dream job, I want you to know that I'm coming now to a dream job, and what I left behind is in the past, and what I come to is in the future, and we're going to be a part of, come on, this is why I come here, because I believe that we're on the movement side. I know a lot of people call it revival, but I like calling it movement. Why? Because movement defined is out of control multiplication. That what God is going to do here is going to increase exponentially. And I believe with Pastor Kendall and me being here and this team that we have and all that I just explained to you is a recipe with the right ingredients to bring a movement to North Carrollton, to bring a movement to North Dallas, to bring a movement to DFW. And that's what I left and that's why I'm here. So today I wanted to walk you through kind of some steps some steps that I believe will show you my transition, but also link and connect to your life and your transitions. You see, first and foremost, we are called by God to go on mission. So the moment you came to church, the moment you gave your life to Christ, you immediately became a son or daughter of Christ. This is the base foundation. It literally stems from the Latin words, missio dei. Missio Dei, and this is what Missio Dei simply means. It means God's calling or his sending. So when you came to Christ, God is literally calling you to something and sending you to something. So this is the base of all of our lives. This is where our identity starts as a son or daughter of God. And under that mission, our simple basic foundation mission is this. To number one, extol and worship God. To know him. Number two, it's to be good, like to get rid of all the sin and junk in your life and to be in right standing before God. Number three, it's simply to expand the kingdom, to take it further and further and further. And so that in all of us is the mission of God inside of us. There's no negotiation between what he wants to do and say in you beyond those three things. But then we get to this next phase, this calling, to where we can get in out of a broader sense and get into a more individual sense where God can take our personalities. Like someone has a different person. Not all of us have Pastor Andrew Lahan's personality, right? So God can take all different flavors of ice cream to make one good buffet of ice cream, right? And so God takes our giftings and puts us in places. That's why some of us are in graphic design, in IT. Some of us are pastors and evangelists and missionaries and worship leaders and some of us work out as veterinarians and architects and engineers and school teachers and coaches. So the baseline of all of us is mission, but underneath that, what makes us all different is our calling. What has God called us to? I remember when I was a young man, a little white trash boy from Irving, Texas, and back then dressed as a cowboy, booty tight wranglers, those starts up shirt and an old straw hat. I remember making my my way down an aisle one day and gave my heart to Christ. And I remember God so sensitively calling me into the ministry full time to go work for him as a pastor. At that moment, I didn't know about anything else. I just knew God was calling me and that I was to be on mission. You follow me? Then there comes this third phase that we often mostly get tripped up about, and it's the assignment. Mission, calling, and assignment. Assignments are specific. So if calling is personal and it's drawn out to the individual, an assignment is more specific, but it's also empowering that through my calling, God gave me the assignment to go to Youth Alive. In my calling, God gave me the assignment to come work at Freedom Church. 
In my calling, my assignment becomes empowering, a little more localized and specific to what God is wanting to do right here and right now. Not five decades from now, not when I'm 65 or 70, but right now at 42 years of age, the assignment is go to freedom. But often we trip these things up, don't we? We kind of jumble them up in one big bowl of stew And I wanted to give you a little graphic today to help you understand. I want you to put up the first one. This this is kind of the way a pyramid works, right? The base is usually the strongest, and that would be our mission. Then we go to calling and then assignment. And if you and I to travel to Egypt and look at the great pyramids, right? No one in this room would step back and go, look at the base. Oh, its bottom is so beautiful. Man. I wonder who built the base of that thing. No, no, we would all be like, dude, look how high it stands. Look at the pentacle, look at the top. And we always want to look at the top instead of the bottom, but the bottom is truly the foundation, what? That really sets the pyramid up for long-term success so that it will stand beyond the generations. And so it is with our calling of God. We have the mission, we have the calling, and we have our individual week-to-week, month-to-month, year-to-year, decade-to-decade assignments. But I wanted to this morning, because sometimes we get tripped up, I wanted to flip the pyramid And I wanted to look at it like this, that number one, first and foremost, the banner of our identity is not wrapped up in our assignments. You see, the top of the pyramid is the sexiest part. Ooh, look at the tie, so beautiful, it's so good. No one looks at the base. And sometimes we get more wrapped up in our assignments and find our identity more in, I'm the pastor of Freedom Church. I'm a veterinarian over here on Josie Lane. I'm a school teacher over here at Hebron High School. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in our assignments, but our assignments change. What we should be wrapped up in is that number one, the biggest, strongest part is the mission. I'm glorifying God, I'm doing good, and I'm what? Expanding his kingdom. And then under that, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, By the way, by the way, beyond me being a son or daughter, I am a school teacher. I work as an entrepreneur. I start IT businesses. Like this is my calling. And then under that comes what? Our assignments. Mission, calling, and assignments. Also important that we figure out our identity. Why? Because assignments change. And what shouldn't change is your identity, your struggle, your who you are and what you do. No, no, no. It's set in stone from the very top. I'm on mission for God. And throughout my life, God will give and disperse always different assignments. Calling and mission, and I'm setting a foundation here. Calling and mission never change, but assignments do. It's like this. When Kyle started out, the little Wrangler boy in the booty tight jeans, I came to Christ, and what happened? I gave my life to him and got the vision, mission, and calling. I just knew I was gonna work for God. I had no idea where that call was gonna take me when we were 22 years old and went to Aurora, Colorado and we were youth pastors. And then we came to Flower Mount, Texas and we're youth pastors. And all of our 20s were youth pastoring. I had no idea that then my assignment would change and what, I would go youth alive for the next 12 years that you just watched the last 12 years of my life flash before my eyes. And then I had no idea. I would have never dreamed it up, made it up, that then my assignment would change and I would come to Freedom Church as the executive pastor. Walked in and out of this building hundreds and thousands of times and never not once did I think that one day I would be here. But what happened? The mission and calling stayed the same. My address just changed. Kyle's going to be the same Kyle. Janelle's going to be the same Janelle. My family's going to be the same. But what happens, what happens is, is God takes us through ages and phases so that what? He can accomplish his purpose and will. I am the same calling, but a different location. So watch this. In Acts chapter 10, we are introduced to two characters. One of them's name is Cornelius. Cornelius is over here in this town called Caesarea, and he's before the Lord. And the Bible says that Cornelius was a devout, righteous, God-fearing man. And one day God dropped a vision in Cornelius' house and said, Cornelius, I want you to send men down to Joppa and find this young man named Peter. Peter has an assignment that you need. So all the while over here, Cornelius is having a dream. Peter's over here about lunchtime getting hungry in Acts chapter 10. And the Bible says that he goes up onto a rooftop and begins to set and daydream. 
And in this daydream, the Bible says that God lowered a sheet, a, a sheet down with four corners, and on the top of the sheet, there are all these animals and foods that Peter, being a Jew, wasn't supposed to eat. And Peter's response to God saying, Peter, eat, eat. I know you're hungry. I know you're ready for them cinnamon rolls. I know you're hungry for those enchiladas. I know you're ready for them nachos. And Peter backs up and says, God, I would never touch that. I would never eat that. I'm a Jew and I don't touch and I don't eat uncommon, unclean things. But God said, eat. And he didn't just say it once, but he lowered it twice and he said, eat. And Peter said, no, 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 God. And he did it a third time, the Bible said, he lowered the sheet with the same instruments, the same food, the same animals on it, and he said, eat again. And then Peter then, what I believe, had a rewiring of his hard drive, that God was doing something in him, changing his assignment. His calling was the same, his mission was the same, but God was trying to get a Jew to take the calling and mission, now over here to Caesarea, to a Gentile people that Peter didn't think belonged in his group that they didn't deserve the same Jesus, the same gospel, and the same spirit. But over here, Peter was being rewired through his assignment. So Peter comes over, knocks on the door, and goes in the house. It begins to preach a pretty powerful short sermon. I'm gonna read it to you right here. In verse 34 of chapter 10, it says, Peter opened his mouth and said, truly I understand that God shows no partiality, He's the same to the Gentile and the Jew. And that in every nation, those who fear him and do what is right, God is there. And that the word he sent to Israel, preaching the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, that he is Lord of all, that you yourselves know what happened throughout all the region and how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all of those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we, Peter said, we are all witnesses of what he did both in the country of Jews and in Jerusalem, how they put Jesus to death by hanging him on a tree. But God, God raised him up on the third day and made him to appear not only to all the people, but to us who have been chosen by God, the Jews, as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. Verse 42 says, then he commanded us to preach to the people and testify that he is the one who has been appointed by God to be the judge of the living and dead, that all who believe in him and that all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness through Jesus Christ in his name. And then it said, once Peter finished his great short sermon on a Sunday morning at 1045 in front of all of Cornelius' household, it said that the Holy Spirit fell and devoured those people. The Holy Spirit erupted in their souls with praises and worship unto God and that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other tongues and the supernatural power of God began to flow through them. And then one person, a very dignified, wise person said, well, don't these also belong in the water of baptism? And Peter said, duh. And so they take them all out to a local body of water and baptize in the water. What a powerful chapter we see where not only salvation is there, but water baptism is there. Spirit empowerment, spirit life, speaking in tongues, all kinds of prophecy are there. And we see the beautiful ministry of Peter all in one chapter that connects to his mission and his calling. What was his mission? To glorify God, to do good, and to expand the kingdom. What was his calling? Oh, he shows us there that his calling was to preach the good news of peace, number one. Number two, to preach the cross. Number three, it was to build and make disciples. And number four, it was to what? Release the Spirit's supernatural power now, not just to Jews, but to all people. You see, his mission and calling were concrete, but now his address was changing. Now his assignment was released to a new place and a new people. You say, Kyle, what are you talking? about how does this do with me every single one of us in our lives we must first identify with calling and mission not assignment sometimes those assignments aren't so glamorous are they come on I had a friend that a childhood friend that went to India to be a missionary we would do the old FaceTime and he would tell me, Kyle, I'm struggling with what to eat and I'm struggling with the conversations and the language. I'm struggling being so many hundreds and hundreds, 
thousands of miles away from my family, Kyle, I'm struggling. You see, his mission and calling were the same, but his assignment had changed. And sometimes we get tripped up on the assignments because sometimes they're really good and sometimes they're tough. How tough that must have been for Peter to break the rewiring and go down to a people that he thought was unclean. But if God's kingdom, the mission of God is going to expand and reach all people, sometimes we can't be so comfortable in our assignments that we're not listening and being obedient and willing to change addresses. Kyle and Janelle Embry came to Freedom Church, just changed addresses, but our calling and mission are the same. And so for so many of you in this room, God is trying to awaken an assignment inside of you. Calling the same, mission the same, but assignment, assignment. And I just believe that this morning, God's giving a release. I've already had confirmation from the first two services that assignments are changing. I'm not saying you move to Washington, D.C. like Ignacio. Come on, a great family in our church, they just moved to Washington, D.C. this week, and we're really sad for them to go and leave, but watch this, his mission didn't change, his calling didn't change, his assignment just changed. What about one of our coaches, one of our great coaches, he's already been watching online this morning, he's been texting me all morning, he said, Kyle, I can't believe you're talking about me. Listen, Coach Seth Vansell received a job from McKinney to go up to Gunther, Texas. His calling is the same basketball coach to a bunch of young men and women at a basketball team. His mission is the same. God just moved his address. He's still going to passionately pour into young men. He's still going to coach them up on basketball. He's still going to teach them the Christian way. He's going to do all those things the same, but his assignment just changed. And you know what we'll never know? We'll never know why. God orchestrated that maybe he would leave this place for someone else to come in behind him. God orchestrated for him to go there because his personality may have fit in perfect for a time and a season in Gunther High School. Do you understand that sometimes through all of the waiting, we get so frustrated on God and God's saying, if you would just, come on, get on top of the rooftop and wait for me and I will show you vision and I will re-hardwire and I will bring new details in your life and I will take you to your next assignment. Are you following me? That there are people in this room today, there are people watching online. Your assignments are going to change, but your mission and calling, they never do. And what I want you to learn from my story is this. I was stubbornly patient. Stubborn. All those pastors told me you should have left a long time ago. You're a balding middle-aged white guy. What do you got speaking to a bunch of teenagers? You're probably so irrelevant. You probably don't even have Snapchat or any of those things. How could you ever talk to teenagers if you don't have tattoos and a mohawk? Patient, patient, I was waiting on God. Me and my wife are praying, we're waiting on God for our next assignment. Pretending like we're gonna be there forever, but waiting for the next assignment. And God pops it up and says, this is the door. And in all of our frustrations, what we don't understand, I close with this, is that while Cornelius was receiving the vision, also Peter at the same time was receiving the vision. And what Peter didn't understand was, was that behind the scenes, behind the scenes, there were three men on their way to knock on the door and take him to his next assignment. And what I wanted to tell you this morning is this, is that so many of you are waiting. So many of you are frustrated with God. So many of you say, God, what's next in my life? Maybe it's a job transfer. Maybe it's an internal spiritual authority that you haven't received yet. And this is what I want you to hear. There are three men on the way to knock on your door. So wait patiently. Come on, trust in God. Be stubborn until He moves you. Don't move early. Don't move late. But when the door knocks, open and walk in to your next assignment.